Davi, uh, who is now uh, an assistant professor at the University of Essen in Germany. So congratulations, uh, Professor Davi. Thank you, Kevin, and welcome to my talk on CFLAT. The work that I will present today is a joint work with a couple of co-authors from TU Darmstadt, Alto University, Trustonic, and UC Irvine. As we all know, embedded systems are prevalent in our today's digital society. And these systems execute different kinds of software programs where most of these software programs are written in native languages like C and C++ and are thereby prone to memory corruption and memory safety problems that an attacker can exploit to run arbitrary malicious actions or even inject and upload malicious code on these devices. And there have been two recent studies at USENIC Security and NDSS that demonstrate that embedded systems and IoT devices in general offer a large attack surface for remote malware attacks and also software exploits. To give you some recent vulnerabilities, consider the NetUSB flaw that affected millions of IoT devices where an attacker only needed to exploit a simple stack-based buffer overflow in the kernel to launch a root ex uh, kernel root exploit. In one of the studies I just mentioned, the researchers showed that uh, an authentication cookie suffered from a buffer overflow uh, vulnerability allowing uh, the attacker to compromise several routers. And finally, we continuously see reports on vulnerabilities on smart medical devices threatening, in these cases, the safety and health of the patient. And of course, you probably have heard about the many or the uh, latest uh, denial of service attacks where compromised IoT devices have been used to uh, run the denial of service. So what can we do to improve the situation? One direction is remote attestation, which allows remote checking of the trustworthiness, including the software stack of a remote and embedded device. It builds up an, att uh, an attestation protocol that Ahmad introduced in his talk, where we have two parties, the verifier and the prover, and the verifier starts the attestation by sending a challenge to the prover. The prover then next measures its software state, typically by using a hardware trust anchor. In practice, a TPM, a trusted platform module, is used to calculate a hash over the binaries that have been, have been loaded on the prover's side. Afterwards, a final hash value is sent back to the verifier. He then consults his measurement database to see if a correct configuration has been set up on the prover's side. Hence, the assumption here is that the verifier knows the binaries to be loaded and also their order, how they are loaded on the prover's side. Remote attestation actually has a long history that dates probably back to 2001 when there, there were the first TPM specification has been released. In 2004, several researchers um, uh, introduced the notion of property-based attestation, meaning moving beyond simply hashing uh, binaries, but rather attesting real properties of the system. Another research direction is software-based attestation. Here, the motivation is to uh, avoid any hardware changes and completely implement software, uh, remote attestation in software, for instance, by calculating a checksum over the memory contents. However, software-based attestation has very strong assumptions about the channel and about the optimalism of the algorithm. In 2005, dynamic root of trust was introduced, which allows a kind of late launch, so an application module can be dynamically loaded into a trusted execution environment, and prominent examples in this field are Intel TXT or recently Intel SGX. Since TPMs are not likely to be deployed on embedded systems due to cost reasons, several researchers focused on introducing minimal trust anchors. Here, prominent examples are Smart or Trustlight. Finally, there, have been also, there has been also research in authenticating the prover to the verifier, and that can be, for instance, done based on a physical unclonable function. However, these schemes also make very strong assumptions about the security and robustness of the path itself. And finally, as you have seen in the last talk, a very recent direction is attesting a network of devices. One of the key limitations that uh, we identified in current binary attestation schemes is that they don't address runtime attacks because they only attest uh, when the software is loaded if the bi uh, hash of the uh, binary is still valid, but don't attest the actual behavior of the program. In general, we can distinguish between two types of runtime attacks. 
control flow and non-controlled data attacks. These attacks can be best represented with their control flow graph, where the control flow graph depicts the valid execution paths a program may follow at runtime. The nodes in this graph are basic blocks, sequence of assembler instructions, and the control flow transitions are, for instance, branch instructions. If the program suffers from a program vulnerability, then the attacker can inject malicious code into the address space of the application, corrupt a code pointer, such as a return address, and then redirect the execution to the injected code. Fortunately, today's systems, even embedded systems, feature data execution prevention, thereby denying any execution from data memory. However, as you probably have heard, attackers have moved to so-called code reuse attacks, such as return-oriented programming, where they build gadget chains out of existing code to run arbitrary, malicious, and Turing-complete computation. A more subtle attack is a non-controlled data attack, because that attack does not introduce new control flow edges, but rather exploits existing privileged paths in the CFG. Consider for this that node B would be a, a switch case statement, and a data flow vulnerability exists in this program, allowing the attacker to exactly control the operation mode here. If this is the case, then the attacker can probably introduce a privileged pass uh, to node C, which could be a recovery routine or another authenticated pass. Of course, there has been a lot of research in defending against these attacks. Prom prominent examples are CFI, DFI, CPI, and remote dynamic attestation. Although these, all these schemes provide a very good protection against these attacks, they are not directly suitable for the sake of control flow and runtime attestation. First, integrity-based schemes usually target a specific runtime attack class, either control flow attacks or non-control data attacks. And second, they only perform checks, usually perform checks on an isolated branch and see if that branch goes to a valid destination, where they miss the entire flow of the execution. This brings me to the contributions of this work. We design and implement CFLAT, which is a control flow attestation scheme that detects control flow and non-control data attacks for embedded system software and requires for that not, no access to source code. To demonstrate the effectiveness of CFLAT, we also applied it to tier two real-world embedded system software, specifically an open syringe pump and a soldering iron temperature controller. CFLAT is based on two assumptions. First, we assume that a trust anchor is available on the embedded systems. The trust anchor allows us to perform an isolated measurement for static and runtime control flow attestation. And it also allows us to generate a fresh and authentic attestation report. Second, we also assume data execution prevention to prevent the attacker from simply injecting code on the embedded device and executing it from data memory. As I said before, embedded systems already provide protection against these attacks, in particular those embedded systems that feature a memory protection unit. The big picture of CFLAT is as follows. First, the verifier runs a control flow graph analysis based on static and dynamic analysis. He identifies the correct and legitimate paths in, in this program. For instance, in this example, P1 and P2. He also needs to identify the loops in this program. As we will see in a couple of minutes, identifying loops is crucial for control flow attestation. Then he measures the pass and stores uh, the valid pass in a measurement database. Here in our example, we have P1 and P2, and also the pass including the loop and the number of loop iterations. Then the program is executed on the prover side. And there we have a trusted component here called runtime pass measurement that measures the pass that is really taken by the prover. If a valid pass is taken, like P2, then that pass gets reported to the verifier and exactly matches the one that we have in the measurement database. However, if a control flow attack is uh, launched by an attacker, here indicated by the red arrow, then a completely different pass measurement is transmitted that does not match any of those paths that we have stored before. So now the question is, how can we really measure the pass efficiently? Because one naive approach would be to simply transmit all the branching information, including source and destination addresses, to the verifier. However, that would lead to a very long attestation response and also would require cumbersome processing uh, from the verifier side. 
Inspired by the traditional static binary uh, attestation, which calculates a hash over the binary, we extend the scheme to also apply to control flow transitions, where we have a hash measurement function that takes two inputs. One is the previous hash, meaning the hash of the previous control flow transition, and the node just executed. Given a simple control flow graph, the hash calculation would work as follows. We first start with a start value of zero, because we have no previous hash value available, and measure also the, the node that has, has been executed in this example, node A. If the pass to node C is followed, then we take again the previous hash value, which is hash one, the node executed, which is B, and uh, measure the, the pass that has been executed so far. So for this simple control flow graph, we get three valid hash measurements, hash three, hash four, and hash six, and only these measurements are valid from the verifier side. And as you can see, the verifier now knows exactly which pass has been followed by simply looking at the hash value. There's one challenge. When applying this scheme to loops, then we get an exhaustive number of loop hashes because every loop iteration and every loop pass introduces a new <laughs> hash value, which is then very complicated for the verifier to check. To tackle this challenge in C-flat, we simply treat loops as subgraphs and report the hash values individually plus the number of iterations we have seen that hash value in the past. So consider for this a slightly modified control flow graph where we have a while condition and inside the loop we also have an if condition. So there are two possible loop paths, one that goes over node D and another one that goes over node E. We start the hash calculation as before but when we figure out that a loop is entered here at node B, then we start a completely new cumulative hash chain, indicated by the new start value of zero. Finally, we get two possible hash values for that loop, which are hash 6A and hash 6B, and these are then reported in the attestation response. In particular, when the loop is not entered, we simply calculate the hash over node A, B, and F, and don't don't include any of the loop measurements. However, if the loop has been entered, this, the attestation response is slightly extended by follow, the following data structure. We point, we first have the loop entry hash, which is the hash seen just before we entered the loop, and then the uh, seen hash values inside the loop plus the number of iteration. This allows the verifier to exactly track and uh, verify how many times a loop pass has been executed. I don't have time to go into further details like nested loops, break statements, and recursive functions, but I point the interested ones to our technical report um, to check out more examples on how this works. Now let's turn to the implementation of CFLAT. For our prototype implementation, we chose Raspberry Pi 2 because it offers a nice API for uh, ARM Truststone, our trust anchor in CFLAT. In general, the architecture can be divided into two worlds. We have the normal world where the application is executing and the secure world where the measurement is taken. The application is instrumented based on binary instrumentation techniques and uh, whenever there is a control flow transition, we redirect the execution flow to the, one of the trampolines. The trampolines save the context, call the measurement engine, and then the control flow is redirected back to the application binary. To give you a glimpse on how the binary instrumentation works, consider the following ARM code based example in which we have four control flow transitions, two function calls, one direct and one indirect, and two returns, one based on the stack and another one based on a register. All these control flow transitions are replaced using binary instrumentation techniques with a function call on ARM based on a branch with link instruction. Conveniently, this instruction sets the link register on ARM, and the link register holds always the return address, uh, or in this example, uh, the address of the next instruction. We have trampolines per branch time, meaning for a dedicated brand, uh, trampoline for a direct call. When this trampoline is executed, we first store the execution context, we look up the target based on that link register, which has been set before, on, uh, based on a branch table, we then uh, invoke a secure monitor call to call the measurement engine. The measurement engine receives source and destination address of the next branch and then uh, performs the hash calculation. 
Finally, we restore the context and branch to the destination. There's one challenge on ARM. If we have leaf functions, then these leaf functions return based on a register. And the register uh, of interest here is a link register. And as you can see, we always clobber the link register because we use the branch with link instruction. In order to preserve the functionality of the program, we proceed as follows. When there is a function call, we additionally save the link register into a dedicated memory area, the saved LR. Hence, when the return takes place, we simply uh, restore uh, the link register from the saved LR re register and then preserve the program's functionality. But the message here is really that for every control flow transition, we have a trampoline. That trampoline calls the measurement engine to perform the hash calculation. I already mentioned we have two case studies, one on an open syringe pump and another one on the soldering iron temperature controller. For the sake of time, I only focus in the rest of the presentation for the, on the open syringe pump. The syringe pump is an electromechanical system that allows uh, dispensing and withdrawing small amounts of liquids. The original implementation of the open source syringe pump targets Arduino boards. So we needed to port, it, port this code to Raspberry Pi, which didn't require so much changes. Finally, we got 300, over 300 CFG edges, including 20 loops, and the syringe pump mainly contains two functions, set quantity to set the amount of liquid and move the syringe either to withdraw or dispense <coughs> liquid. When, when CFLED is applied to this open syringe pump, we first need to set when the attestation needs to start. Of course, it would not make sense to start the attestation when the device is idle. So we provide an API that allows a developer to set exactly the attestation uh, start when a real command is happening. In this example, when the process serial function is invoked. The process serial function then checks the argument checks whether there's a, a liquid should be dispensed or withdrawn, and finally starts the action by um, providing the direction and the amount of liquid that should be dispensed or withdrawn. The resulting control flow graph looks kind of, this, uh, looks kind of like this. And if we in particular look at the action function, then it is structured as follows. We first receive the bolus, which is the dose of drug. We translate the bolus to motor steps, then we check the direction, and finally we have uh, a loop that moves the motor stepper according to the direction that has been set before. It's noteworthy to mention that independent of the amount of liquid that flows, we always get two unique hash measurements, one for the push operation and one for the pull operation. Here you can see why it is also important to um, hash uh, loops separately, because otherwise, every loop iteration would lead to a different hash value for the loop, uh, for the push and pull operation. But here we report the loop measurement separately and the verifier can conveniently access the counter here for the iterations to see how, uh, how much of liquid has been dispensed or withdrawn. This slide shows a slight uh, debug output of our C flat lock when applied to the syringe pump. As you can see, as you, you will probably not see this, but all these numbers are the same, independent of the amount of liquid that flows. The only difference here is that the counter differs depending on the amount of liquid that has been dispensed or withdrawn. We also constructed several exploits to test the effectiveness of the syringe pump. One exploit um, dispensed liquid at an unexpected time. However, this introduces a control flow that has not been expected before and thereby leads to a hash measurement that is illegal and is not stored in the measurement database. A more subtle attack is a non-controlled data attack where we uh, constructed an exploit that changed the amount of liquid. However, the verifier can then easily check the loop iteration counter to see how much of liquid has been dispensed by simply checking how, how many times the motor has been stepped forward. The performance impact on C of C-flat uh, heavily depends on the number of control flow transitions that are attested. To break this down into real numbers, consider liquid dispenses per hour that are usually in the range of 0 0.5 millimeters to 2.0 milliliters, and as you can see, there's only a couple of seconds. The distribution of the overhead 
also is different depending on the individual step. So we have 10%, approximately 10% for the trampolines. We have, uh, of course, more overhead for the context switch because we need to switch to the secure world. And finally, the hash calculation take the most, uh, takes most of the time and definitely here's also some room for optimization. It's noteworthy to mention that C flat attests control flows. That means if you have a pure data attack that does not influence any control flows, this is not represented uh, into an uh, illegitimate hash value. Consider for this an example where you have a send function that simply reads from a buffer, and if that data pointer is corrupted to point to a cryptographic key, then that key is sent, but the control flow remains the same. The scalability of CFLIT heavily depends on the complexity uh, of the program and also its program size. If the program is more complex and the size grows, then we get more valid hash values, which are then more cumbersome to process by the verifier, and also it's more cumbersome to uh, generate the control flow graph of the application. However, for the embedded system softwares that we have in mind, like the open storage pump, C flat scales very well because these uh, programs are not as complex as, for instance, desktop PC uh, software programs. I already mentioned that the context switch introduces uh, additional overhead. In particular, for the platform that we have tested, there are thousands of cycles to just switch from normal world to secure world. However, there are new platforms uh, not yet released, but the Trust Zone M platform uh, performs this context switch to the secure world only in a few cycles, and when applied to CFLAT, that would heavily boost also the performance of CFLAT in the future. To conclude this talk, existing binary attestation schemes only hash the binary when it is loaded, but don't attest really when the binary is executed and its program control flows. CFLAT enables control flow attestation and thereby detects subtle attacks such as control flow attacks and non-control data attacks. In our ongoing and future work, we are currently working on hardware support for CFLAT to also increase the performance and expand uh, the application of CFLAT to more embedded system software. Finally, I want to mention that the code of CFLAT is, um, is available. You can check out our website on this. And uh, we also have the opportunity today uh, to show you a demo. Thomas, uh, who is here in the front, has a demo with him. So if any one of you is interested, just ask Thomas and he will show you the demo. With that, I conclude this talk and I'm ready to take your questions. Lucas, you show that uh, between the uh, one millimeter and two millimeter uh, of uh, movement uh, on the syringe, uh, the time difference is, is, is quite uh, big, almost increasing linearly. But yeah, it's uh, the double. And the only difference is that the number of loops that you're executing. Uh, isn't there a way to get around this? Because you're just calculating the same hash, right? And uh, most of your time is, is spent on, on calculating the hash. Yeah, that's definitely one thing we could uh, optimize. Currently, we do the hash measurement simply uh, at every control flow transition, but uh, we, are, we are just working on exactly this point that we have some hardware support to recognize when the same loop is executed again, and then uh, only need to store uh, to uh, increase the counter, increment the counter, rather than doing the whole hash calculation again. Yeah, that's definitely something we are currently working on. Any further questions? Thanks very much.